Hi everyone, my name is Michael McLean and I'm the creator of the Michael McLean Talks YouTube channel. Before I go on, please remember to like, share, subscribe and comment on all of the content on this channel. Thank you so much for coming onto my platform. You're considered to be a legendary figure within the Labour Party and you were the leader of the opposition from 1983 to 1992. And you were also the Vice President of the European Commission from 1919, from 1999 to 2004. So thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Sorry I'm late. Oh, no problem at all. First question I'd like to ask you, is following Labour's landslide defeat in 1983, Michael Foote resigned and you became Labour leader. What are the reasons why some parties go from left to centrist or right in order to win general elections? Um, I, I'll put it like this. Um, after 1979 defeat, there were elements in the party that um, made a lurch towards what they thought was ideology. Uh, this was partly a response to what they perceived to be the caution and failure of the Callaghan and Wilson governments from 74 to 79. It was partly a reaction against the destructive policies that plainly were being followed by Margaret Thatcher. And it was partly the tendency of parties, all parties, but particularly the Labour Party, to surge towards the left in moments of defeat, as if um, the confirming, reasserting of doctrine uh, would provide protection uh, against the despair felt at defeat. Now, on all those grounds, uh, they were wrong, except, of course, that protest and opposition to the policies of Margaret Thatcher, Jeffrey Howe, which brought a massive rise in unemployment and the loss of about 25% of British manufacturing, together with very substantial public service cuts. That was justified. But of course, if you're going to have credibility in those circumstances, you've got to provide workable alternatives. And whenever tested, that element of people who described themselves as the left, but they weren't terribly radical or socialist in their real commitment, uh, they never came up with practical answers. So consequently, by the time I was elected in 1983, I knew that that element in the party had to be taken on and overcome. And I set myself to doing that. So fundamentally, I suppose, I had to fight on two fronts, first as leader of the Labour Party in opposition to a conservative government, which I did with some ferocity and I hope constructiveness. But in addition, I had to deal with the organized elements of the ultra-left who were bringing the party into disrepute and making it look absurd and sometimes dangerous, and a broader left that was simply wrong in its mindset. It wasn't intent upon any malevolence, but was simply overdoing the simplicity of the task of the Labour Party. Um, and I did that in a variety of ways. First of all, by constantly reminding people that we were a democratic socialist party uh, with no room for secretive internal organizations 
And secondly, that we had to represent to the people of Britain a practical alternative that was patriotic, uh, committed to economic endeavor and productiveness, and was facing outward to the rest of the world as a matter of not only our internationalism, but our realism. And I spent the next nine years doing that. Initially, it was extremely tough. I had no majority on the National Executive Committee, for instance. Uh, and as I secured wider support as the years went past with a variety of arguments, uh, it became slightly easier. But it was it was <laughs> it was never a cakewalk. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And I'm just going to draw upon what you said in your previous question because you talked about making the party more democratic. But yeah. how did you do that? How did you bring people together to turn the future of Labour around? I employed a variety of means. One in terms of general stances. Uh, when issues came up to make it clear that we were always on the side of common sense and our common sense contrasted starkly with the doctrinaire policies of monetarism being followed by the government and starkly contrasting to the crypto revolutionary rhetoric of the ultra-left. And because the great majority of people in the labor movement, in the party, in the trade unions, identified with the common sense attitude, gradually the shift in their commitment and their support came about. Uh, secondly, I took a great deal of trouble to continually go around the country not just to uh, public occasions and events, but also to bring together several constituency Labour parties in an area and to speak in behind closed doors with great candor to them. The rules of these Labour forums meetings, as I call them, was that they could say anything they wanted and I could say anything I wanted. And I guess the straight talking was increasingly convincing so that I could see as the time passed, as the events accumulated, uh, a change in the mindset, in the mood, in the attitude of Labour Party members to the prospect of election and trying to secure power. Obviously, despite all the work that I and my colleagues uh, undertook, especially colleagues in the front bench and colleagues on the National Executive Committee, where after three years, I managed to secure a small, um, frequent majority. That wasn't always guaranteed, but they began to shift as well. To some extent, I was aided in bringing people together by exposing, denouncing, and then by proper due process, expelling elements of the ultra-left who were acting uh, in breach of Labour Party rules. And that's when the expulsion of militant and some other sectarian groups came about. I'm was able to demonstrate that they had no commitment to the well-being and the advance of the Labour Party. They were uh, operating often in clandestine circumstances as interests trying to take advantage of their position in a mass movement. Uh, that led to a certain amount of drama, uh, but nevertheless, it was... Uh, a risk I had to take uh, because the well-being, indeed the soul of the Labour Party was at stake. 
And in addition, of course, that meant that the degree and breadth of support for labor in the ballot box was also at stake. So I had to fight to defend the Labour Party and then when that was secure to advance the Labour Party and that brought people together. Thank you so much and you were just such a courageous figure during that time and you served as the leader of the opposition during the Thatcher era. So please tell us about your relationship with Margaret Thatcher during her time as Prime Minister. Well I had no relationship really. Uh, Mrs Thatcher had what could be called a relationship with very few people, even people on her own side would communicate, especially after she'd gone. (laughs) Their frustration at the way in which she was detached from their ongoing concerns and their perception of realities. Of course, it culminated with the fall of Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, But for years before that, um, neither I nor anybody else had anybody that could be described as a relationship. I think, uh, on reflection then and now, that her remoteness came from a certain innate chilliness of character, but it also came from the idea that she had that in order to remain powerful, and to secure dominance, she had to be distant, not just from the people in general, but from those who might make her more flexible. She interpreted flexibility, um, pragmatism, as weakness, which of course it isn't. Um, Only people with shallow convictions are afraid of compromise. The people with deep convictions know that they can compromise and uh, secure uh, gradual and definite progress. They don't have to be on any kind of high horse and they don't have to embrace anything resembling purity. We want to honor our undertakings in full, in every sphere, every area of policy. We want to say what we mean and mean what we say. We want to keep our promises. Because we want to do that, it is essential that we don't make false promises. A precondition to honoring those or any other undertakings that we give. That precondition is unavoidable, total, insurmountable, and it's a precondition, and in this movement we don't want to surmount. It is the precondition that we win a general election. That is the precondition. There are some in our movement who, when I say we must reach out in that fashion, accuse me of an obsession with electoral politics. There is no need in this task to surrender our socialism. There's no need to abandon or even try to hide. I remind you, every one of you, of something that every single one of you said in the desperate days before June the 9th, 1980. You said to each other on the streets, you said to each other in the cars rushing around, you said to each other in the committee rooms, Elections are not won in weeks, they are won in years. That's what you said to each other. That's what you got to remember. Um, I became really conscious of the way in which that remoteness was a deficiency in a prime minister when I, after 1990, encountered Mrs. Thatcher's successor, John Major. Um, we never were friendly and never had any kind of cozy relationship. We had a very business-like relationship. 
But I was always conscious that, for instance, when he provided me with confidential security briefings, uh, he was on top of the subject and being very straight, both about any positives or negatives. And of course, you'll recall this was the time, for instance, of the provisional IRA and the so-called loyalist paramilitaries fighting in Northern Ireland and inflicting devastating uh, bomb attacks on the British mainland. And also it was in the immediate wake of Saddam Hussein's uh, invasion of Kuwait. And so consequently, we had to have several conversations on fairly delicate security issues. Um, he was adult. He was grown up. He understood that I was uh, a vehement opponent of the use of violence in politics and indeed an opponent for many years of Saddam Hussein's fascism. And uh, we had a, a fairly straightforward and mature relationship. Uh, even on issues like that, Mrs. Thatcher was reserved and communicative, and I wasn't always sure that she was right on top of the issues, even though she had a reputation as a ferociously hard worker. So I knew that my uh, the business that I had to undertake with Margaret Thatcher was missing the degree of frankness, candor, mature intimacy that's necessary between a prime minister and the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Um, but it really became highlighted and very graphic when I encountered a different prime minister with an altogether more grown-up attitude. Thank you so much for that answer. And I also wanted to ask you, what are your hobbies outside of politics? Um, well, beyond my grandchildren and avid interest in rugby and football, and of course, lots and lots of reading, um, I can't say I've got much in the way of uh, hobbies. Obviously, I used to play sport, cricket, rugby and football, but that was a long time ago. Uh, my interest is sustained, but unfortunately, not now my activity. <laughs> Thank you. And what, what advice would you give to a young person that would like to be a member of parliament? Well, first of all, never think in terms of uh, the ambition to be a member of parliament. And certainly never think of political activity at any level as being a career. Some of the most boring and unproductive people I've ever met were career politicians. They were people who might have started with a strong sense of purpose, usually a decent sense of progressive purpose, but by paying much more attention and giving much more primacy to their own advancement, their career advancement, they lost that sense of purpose. And um, that's something that young people engaged in, active in democratic politics should never do. So sustain your convictions, refine your convictions, Get them worn by experience of life and reading and discussion, all those things by all means, and be willing to compromise because you hold values deeply, but never forget what originally made you want to be a public representative and to be active in, uh, in democratic politics and adapt yourself to the circumstances uh, as they evolve. 
always be willing to question your original analysis, always be willing to move your opinions as the facts move, which they do. And if you do that, and you're very, very lucky, one day some people will want to nominate you for office. And if you're even more lucky, you will get elected. Um, but never think of it in career terms. Always think of it as a vocation that is dedicated to trying to secure improvement in the lives of your fellow human beings, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your country, and your planet. Thank you so much for that answer. And according to the BBC, Philip Collins, a former speechwriter to Tony Blair, regards you as one of the best orators of your generation. So how do you draw upon your values and ethics to produce speeches that move the hearts of people across the nation? Uh, well, it's very kind of Phil to say that. Um, and people have been generally a, a laudatory about some of my speeches. Obviously, not every speech <laughs> was made of gold. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, <coughs> I've got a bit of a chest problem. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I never had any form of uh, oratorical training. I listened and I looked, uh, and I suppose, naturally, by osmosis, really, uh, I always wanted to communicate ideas and prospects in a way that people could relate to and better understand if I painted pictures for them when I was speaking. And that was innate, I guess. I, uh, I never sort of consciously developed it or had any particular tricks and certainly no training. But uh, winning arguments was always a matter of importance, as it should be to anyone with basic democratic convictions, and I certainly felt that as a democratic socialist. And so I guess that's where it came from. I realized very early on, both in my first efforts on my feet, but also listening to other people, that if you could get your audience to understand that what you were saying related to their realities, uh, both their experience of life, their hopes in life, their ideals, and their doubts, then they would be listening to you and possibly be convinced. And I suppose that's fairly straightforward. Uh, anybody who thinks about it and thinks about communication will understand the importance of that. And I just got on with it. And uh, I suppose there were two factors. One, um, I like language. I love the theatre. Uh, I've always read poetry um, and prose. And consequently, there were phrases, approaches, uh, systems of analysis that came in a fairly straightforward fashion. So I wasn't afraid of colorful language, if you like. And secondly, I wasn't afraid of sophisticated language as well. If I ever felt that I used a word or a term that my audience didn't understand, and you'll catch that, you don't have to be told that, uh, then I would simplify it further or break it down, 
so that I could be certain that people weren't impeded by the use of a, a sophisticated phrase or idea. And in that respect, I guess I've always been what professionally I was before I was elected to Parliament, and that's an adult educator. I used to teach particularly trade unionists and junior managers, uh, industrial relations, industrial economics, communication, and I suppose that stuck, really. Um, so I think that anybody who's involved in political communication should always be conscious of trying to be an educator, an, an informer, an analyzer, in terms that people can understand. Thank, thank you so much for that. And even some of your, one of your speeches, Joe Biden borrowed elements of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that was, that was just, um, it was funny, but it just showed the influence of who you were as an MP. Well, the thing is that um, Joe uh, used a, a segment of a speech I made when he was running for the Democratic nomination back in 1987-88. And he once uh, used the phrase without attribution. Uh, That was identified by his opponents. Uh, He was, quote, quote, exposed, uh, accused of plagiarism. And uh, on that occasion, he left the campaign trail. Uh, we talked about it afterwards. I, I met him first in 1988, and he explained the circumstances, which I completely accepted. He's a very straight guy. Um, and fortunately, that didn't impede him greatly. And of course, now he's president of the United States. Uh, on the occasions we met, We had a laugh about it. He once uh, introduced me in his office in the Senate um, as, folks, I want you to meet my greatest ever speechwriter. But there were were other people who used sections of my speeches. Uh, Gary Hart was another presidential hopeful uh, until he was silly with his sex life. Um, and others have used segments of my speeches, but uh, they've always attributed where they came from. Not that the audiences in the United States would have had a clue who Neil Kinnock was, but as long as you mention it, uh, then it can't be held against you, and uh, they always took good care to do it, as Joe did on several occasions but missed on one occasion, which was being televised, and the rest is history. Thank you. And could could I ask you, um, Partygate, uh, lockdown parties, and the cost of living crisis have dominated media headlines. What is your opinion on these three topics? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. um, Partygate? Lockdown parties and the cost of living crisis have dominated recent news headlines. Yes. What is your opinion surrounding these political issues and what do you think the government should do about them? Well, it's... I would treat Partygate and everything that went with it as simply stupidity, which at a distance can almost be treated humorously. Certainly... It's generated some terrific jokes. Mm -hmm. But for the fact that the people who were involved in Partygate, including the Prime Minister, and the Mm -hmm. attitude they had towards it, Mm -hmm. demonstrates a view of their place in our system and of the general multitude of people in which I include myself, that is fundamentally disturbing. When people in government and serving government think that they can 
with impunity deliberately break the laws that they've been responsible for introducing and apply to everybody else. That is a level of arrogance, of disdain for the public well-being that is not tolerable in a democratic country. And since in all organizations, to a greater or lesser extent, the tone of conduct is set by those who lead the organization, the prime minister is completely culpable for this disdainful, arrogant breach of law at a time of great national tragedy and peril. In any times, in any circumstances, it would be wrong. It would be justifiably criticized in these times that we've just been through. It is unforgivable. As far as the cost of living crisis is concerned, this is the accumulation of not just global pressures and global difficulties and global shortages and global maldistribution. It's a consequence of years of accumulated policies of incompetence and to some extent of malevolence. Um, one of the fundamental conditions of a good standard of living in a modern democratic society is the quality of public services. Those vital public services have been shrunken for the last 12 years to a remorseless extent so that local government in Britain, which is vital to our democracy and our quality of life and our level of freedom, has been reduced, the funding has been reduced by in some cases over 50% and even in the most moderate cases by over 40%. And it means that our levels of healthcare, education, social care, especially for the elderly and the vulnerable, policing, the quality of infrastructure have all suffered. So we began this current international economic pressure with huge disadvantages in any case. Secondly, our decision, the 52% decision to leave the European Union has inflicted massive costs on our economy, complications, bureaucracy, hoops through which every enterprise has got to jump that was entirely avoidable. And what doesn't get recognized as often as it is, is the shrinkage of economic growth consequent directly from Brexit reduces public resources by a vast amount. Every 1% loss of growth loses nine billion pounds in tax revenues. So without anything other than Brexit, we'd be losing, according to the Office of Budget Responsibility, about 32 billion a year in lost revenues. That is a gigantic amount of revenue to lose, and it either means extra borrowing, or it means extra taxation, or it means further public sector cuts, or a combination of all three, which is what we're seeing now. And then the major additional source of the cost of living crisis, of course, is the surge in, en in energy prices. That too is in part directly a consequence 
of the privatization of energy, of the lack of any coherent plan for the development of renewables, the storing of energy, and culpability for that must lie directly with the government over the last 12 years. I'm not arguing, and I would never argue, that the strategies of the Labour government before 2010 were in any way perfect. But they certainly de demonstrated much greater cogency and responsibility and regard for the well-being of the people and the security of the future than we've seen occurring in the last 12 years. Thank you so much for that answer. And another question that I'd like to ask you is, in your opinion, who are the three greatest post-war prime ministers and why? Post-war? Uh, Clement Attlee, clearly. Uh, and I would say Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. I'd almost uh, put them into one name uh, because of the uh, very great advances they made with growth, generally, with the use of resources, especially in health, education, and combating part. Poverty. So I, I would describe those as the three greatest. Thank you so much. And also, your um, Keir Starmer's decision to remove, take the whip away from Jeremy Corbyn mir mirrored what you did in terms of purging labour of the military tendency. Why do you, why is the far left, do you believe, um, a, a big threat to the Labour Party? They, they're never a big threat, mm -hmm. but they constantly, by their actions, declarations, antics, mm -hmm. mean that the leadership of the Labour Party has to pay attention to them, denounce them, marginalize them. And of course, every time that happens, as it did with me, the impression is given of division. And the general public, rightly in my view, doesn't like divided parties and is less inclined to vote for them. So the first effect that they have is to give the impression of division, even when it's a splinter operation and not any great schism in the party. And that is counterproductive and antagonistic to Labour's purpose. The second thing about them that I object to, as a democratic socialist, is their vanity. The ultra-left is always self-indulgent. It has more regard for its own usually half-baked analysis, borrowed a bit from Marx and a bit from Trotsky and a bit from here and a bit from there lacking in cogency <coughs> <coughs> or in realistic appraisal of the condition of the people and the future of the country. And, well, I used the phrase once, they think in T-shirt slogans. Anything that can't be written on the front of a T-shirt isn't worth bothering with. That is the impression they constantly give me, despite their continued efforts to regard themselves very seriously, very earnestly, and think that everybody else should pay them the same respect. And it's that self-indulgence that I find very, very, very disheartening, indeed repulsive. Um, what is always evident with the ultra-left, uh, insofar as it enters the Labour Party, is that they always put a higher premium on trying to secure power within the Labour Party than power for the Labour Party. And I think they'd be much better off, and certainly Labour would be much better off, if they took up fly-fishing 
something that requires a lot of patience and commitment and doesn't cause any harm except to the fish. Welcome to you. Um, you have called on Jeremy Corbyn to go, but in a sense, why should he? He has got the backing of the membership. And huge numbers of people have come out on the streets over the weekend saying Corbyn must stay, social media and all the rest of it. He has a very, very large constituency. There are lots of people outside Parliament who support him. It remains to be seen uh, how many uh, members of the Labour Party in a vote would support him because, as you will have seen from this morning and recent days' evidence, there has been a significant shift uh, away from Jeremy and uh, members across the country, including newly joined people, have got deep residual doubts about the possibility of him leading the party to election victory. And that means that he should reconsider his position on those grounds. But in addition, the Constitution provides very sensibly uh, for a party in Parliament and also provides that the leader of the party must have a substantial amount of backing from Labour members of Parliament. I can read in a couple of seconds the provision explicitly in the party constitution. And that means that unless the leader can have that substantial support in Parliament, then uh, there should be a contest or the leader should consider his position and do his duty to the party and resign. Do you think... Um, and also wanted to ask, do you believe that Keir Starmer is the man to lead Labour, to make a success of the Labour Party? And if so, why? Yes, I do. Uh, apart from the fact that he is manifestly a very decent man with a strong sense of commitment to the British people and the well-being of our country and indeed the planet... Uh, he's also got the qualities of high intelligence, calmness, maturity that are absent from the current prime minister. So in a system which is continually more present presidential uh, than it previously has been, uh, especially since the time of Margaret Thatcher, it's crucial not only to examine the policies, which of course is of high importance of a party, but also uh, to consider who could and should be leader mm -hmm. of the country. And in those respects, uh, Keir Starmer is supremely better qualified to lead our country than Boris Johnson or anyone who's likely to succeed him. Thank you so much for the answer. And the last question that I want to ask you is pressure is amounting on Boris Johnson to apologise for remarks linking Keir Starmer with a failure to prosecute Jimmy Savile. This isn't easy, even easy for me to say. Um, what is your viewpoints on the remark made by Boris Johnson in the House of Commons? And is there a place for such behavior in contemporary politics? Well, it was a disgraceful lie. Mm. And of course, the code of conduct for ministers, but the automatic natural code of conduct for any grown up people is that if they mislead people, if they tell a lie, whether it's conscious or unconscious, the first thing they have to do is to apologize. And then if the lie is very serious and could potentially be damaging to democracy, to consider their position. And in the case of a prime minister who lies and doesn't apologize, to get out. Yeah. Our constitution is unwritten. It is in some respects extremely vague. I would certainly continue to argue, as I have for many years, for us to have a written constitution, a clear book of rules for the United Kingdom, as in just about every other democracy in the world. We're not going to get that in the short term, 
But central to that constitution is the idea, it's been given the name by Professor Peter Hennessy, the decent chap system of constitution, that ultimately elected people in our system of government must manifest a really grave sense of responsibility. And they must show that by resigning if they are caught in misleading the House of Commons and therefore the British people. And in previous generations, ministers did resign, even when they had apologized and clarified and explained circumstances. They still went. That was right. This prime minister doesn't. And so his statements in the Commons, knowingly misleading people about the reality, the truth about Keir Starmer, means that not only does democratic politics suffer, not only is the leader of the opposition defamed, but our democracy is damaged. Our constitution has a great hole in the middle where responsibility, duty should be. And there are no words really that could sufficiently offer my condemnation of Boris Johnson, but I know what he should do as an adult with democratic responsibilities, the most profound responsibilities that any citizen can ever carry. Thank you so much for this uh, fantastic interview. It's been an absolute pleasure to interview you. Okay, tell me something about yourself now. Where are you from? Oh, so I'm from the London Borough of Harrow. I, yeah, I was born the London Borough of, of Harrow. Harrow, right. What subjects did you read? So I, my first degree is in philosophy and religious studies and my master's is, is in business management. <laughs> right, God and mammon. Yes, that's not a bad combination. <laughs> Thank you.